Chapter 16, A Submarine Forest We had at last arrived on the borders of this forest, doubtless one of the finest of Captain Nemo's immense domains. He looked upon it as his own and considered he had the same right over it that the first men had to the first days of the world, and indeed who would have disputed with him the possession of this submarine property? What other hardier pioneer would come, hatchet in hand, to cut down the thick copses? This forest was composed of large tree plants, and the moment we penetrated under its vast arcades, I was struck by the singular position of their branches, a position I had not yet observed. Not an herb which carpeted the ground, not a branch which closed the trees, was either broken or bent, nor did they extend horizontally, all stretched up to the surface of the ocean. Not a filament, not a ribbon, however thin they might be, but kept as straight as a rod of iron. The Fuchi and the Lianas grew in rigid perpendicular lines due to, the, due to the density of the element which had produced them. Motionless, yet when bent to one side by the hand, they directly resumed their former position. Truly, it was the region of perpendicularity. I soon accustomed myself to this fantastic position, as well as to the comparative darkness which surrounded us. The soil of the forest seemed covered with sharp blocks, difficult to avoid. The submarine flora struck me as being very perfect and richer even than it would have been in the Arctic or tropical, tropical zones where these productions are not so plentiful. But for some minutes I involuntarily confounded the genera, taking zoophytes for hydrophytes, animals for plants, and who would not have been mistaken? The fauna and the flora are too closely allied in the submarine world. These plants are self-propagated and the principle of their existence is in the water which upholds and nourishes them. The greater number, instead of leaves, shoot forth blades of capricious shapes comprised within a scale of colors, pink, carmine, green, olive, fawn, and brown, I saw there, but not dried up as our specimens of the Nautilus are. Pavinari spread like a fan as if to catch the breeze, scarlet ceramides whose laminaries extended their edible shoots of fern-shaped nerososti, which grew to a height of fifteen feet, clusters of acetabuli whose stems increase in size upwards, and numbers of other marine plants, all devoid of flowers. Curious anom anomaly, fantastic element, said an ingenious naturalist, in which the animal kingdom blossoms and the vegetable does not. Under these numerous shrubs, as large as trees of the temperate zone, and under their damp sha shadow, were massed together real bushes of living flowers, hedges of zoophytes, of which blossomed some zebra meanderines, with crooked grooves, some yellow caryophylli, and to complete the illusion, the fish flies flew from branch to branch like a swarm of hummingbirds, whilst yellow lapiscomphi, with bristling jaws, dactylopteri, and monocentrides rose at our feet like a flight of snipes. In about an hour, Captain Nemo gave the signal to halt. I, for my part, was not sorry, and we stretched ourselves under an arbor of alaray, the long, thin blades of which stood up like arrows. This short rest seemed delicious to me. There was nothing wanting but the charm of conversation. But impossible to speak and impossible to answer, I only put my great copper head to counsels. I saw the worthy fellow's eyes glistening with delight, and to show his fat satisfaction, he shook himself in his breastplate of air in the most comical way in the world. After four hours of this walking, I was surprised not to find myself dreadfully hungry. How to account for this state of the stomach, I could not tell. But instead, I felt an insurmountable desire to sleep, which happens to all divers, and my eyes soon closed behind the thick glasses and I fell into a heavy slumber, which the movement alone had prevented before. Captain Nemo and his robust companion stretched in the clear crystal set us the example. How long I remained buried in the drowsiness I cannot judge, but when I woke, the sun seemed sinking toward the horizon. Captain Nemo had already risen, and I was beginning to stretch my limbs when an unexpected apparition, apparition brought me briskly to my feet. A few steps off, 
a monster sea spider about 35 inches high was watching me with squinting eyes ready to spring upon me through my diver's dress was thick enough to defend me from the bite of this animal i could not help shuddering with horror Counsel and the sailor of the Nautilus awoke at this moment. Captain Nemo pointed out the hideous crustacean, and with a blow from the butt gun, butt end of the gun knocked over, and I saw the horrible claws of the monster writhe in terrible convulsions. This accident reminded me that other animals, more to be feared, might haunt these obscure depths, against whose attacks my diving dress would not protect me. I'd never thought of it before, but... I am now resolved to be upon my guard. Indeed, I thought that this halt would mark the termination of our walk, but I was mistaken. For instead of returning to the Nautilus, Captain Nemo continued his bold excursion. The ground was still on the incline. Its declivity seemed to be getting greater and to be leading us to greater depths. It must have been about three o'clock when we reached a narrow valley between high perpendicular walls situated about 75 fathoms deep. Thanks to the perfection of our apparatus, we were 45 fathoms below the limit, which nature seems to have imposed on man as to this submarine excursions. I say 75 fathoms, though I had no instrument by which to judge the distance, but I knew that even in the clearest water, the solar rays could not penetrate further, and accordingly the darkness deepened. At 10 paces, not an object was visible. I was groping my way when I suddenly saw a brilliant white light. Captain Nemo had just put his electric apparatus into use. His companion did the same, and Council and I followed their example. By turning a screw, I established a communication between the wire and the spiral glass, and the sea, lit by our four lanterns, were illuminated for a circle of 36 yards. Captain Nemo was still plunging into the dark depths of the forest, whose trees were getting scarcer at every step. I noticed that vegetable life disappeared sooner than animal life, the Medusiae had already abandoned an arid soil from which a great number of animals, zoophytes, articulata, mollusks, and fishes still obtained sustenance. As we walked, I thought the light of the room cough apparatus would not fail to draw some inhabitant from its dark couch. But if they did approach us, they at least kept at a respectable distance from the hunters. Several times I saw Captain Nemo stop, put his gun to his shoulder, and after some moments, drop it and walk on. At last, after about four hours, this marvelous excursion came to an end. A wall of superb rocks and an, in an imposing mass rose before us. A heap of gigantic blocks and enormous steep granite shore forming dark grottoes, but which presented no practical slope. It was the prop of the island of Crespo. It was the earth. Captain Nemo stopped suddenly. A gesture of this brought us all to a halt, and however Desirines I might be to scale that wall, I was obliged to stop. Here ended Captain Nemo's domains, and he would not go beyond them. Further on was a portion of the globe he might not trample upon. The return began. Captain Nemo had returned to the head of this little band, directing their course without hesitation. I thought we were not following the same road to return to the Nautilus. The new ro road was very steep and consequently very painful. We approached the surface of the sea rapidly, but this return to the upper strata was not so sudden as to cause relief from the pressure too rapidly, which might have produced serious disorder in our organ organization and brought an internal lesion so fatal to divers. Very soon light reappeared and grew and the sun being low on the horizon, the refractions edged and different objects with a spectral ring. At ten yards and a half deep, we walked amidst a shoal of little fishes of all kinds, more numerous than the birds of the air, and also more agile. But no aquatic game worthy of a shot had as yet met our gaze. Then at that moment I saw the captain shoulder his gun quickly, and following a moving object into the shrubs, he fired. I heard a slight hissing, and a creature fell stunned at some distance before us. It was a magnificent sea otter, an anhydrous, and only exclusively marine quadruped. The otter was five feet long and must have been very valuable. Its skin, chestnut brown above and silvery underneath, would have 
made one of those beautiful furs so sought after in Russia and Chinese markets. The fineness and luster of its coat would certainly fetch 80 pounds. I admire this curious animal with its rounded head ornamented with short ears, its round eyes and white whiskers like those of a cat with webbed feet and nails and tufted tail. This precious animal, hunted and tracked by fishermen, has now become very rare and taken refuge chiefly in the northern parts of the Pacific, or probably its race would soon become extinct. Captain Nemo's companion took the beast, threw it over his shoulder, and we continued our journey. For one hour, a plain of sand lay stretched before us. Sometimes it rose to within two yards and some inches of the surface of the water. I then saw our image clearly reflected, drawn inversely, and above us appeared an identical group reflecting our movements and our actions. In a word, like us in every point, except that they walked with their heads downward and their feet in the air. Another effect I noticed, which was the passage of thick clouds, which formed and vanished rapidly. But on reflection, I understand that these seeming clouds were due to the varying thickness of the reeds at the bottom and I could even see the fleecy foam which their broken tops multiplied on the water and the shadows of large birds passing above our heads, whose rapid flight I could discern on the surface of the sea. On this occasion I was witness to one of the finest gunshots which ever made the nerves of a hunter thrill. A large bird of great breadth of, breadth of wing clearly visible approached hovering over us. Captain Nemo's companion shouldered his gun and fired, when it was only a few yards above the waves. The creature fell stunned, and the force of, it, force of its fall brought it within the reach of the dexterous hunter's grasp. It was an albatross of the finest kind. Our march had not been interrupted by this accident. For two hours we followed these sandy plains and then fields of allied, very disagreeable to cross. Candidly, I could do more than I saw a glimmer of light which for a half mile broke the darkness of the water. It was the lantern of the Nautilus. Before twenty minutes were over, we should be on board and I should be able to breathe with ease, for it seemed that my reservoir supplied air very deficient in oxygen. But I did not reckon on an accidental meeting which delayed our arrival for some time. I had remained some steps behind when I presently saw Captain Nemo coming hurriedly toward me. With his strong hand, he bent me to the ground, his companion doing the same to counsel. At first, I knew not what to think of this sudden attack, but I was soon reassured by seeing the captain lie down beside me and remain immovable. I was stretched on the ground, just under shelter of a brush of algae when, raising my head, I saw some enormous mass casting phosphorescent gleams pass blusteringly by. My blood froze in my veins as I recognized two formidable sharks which threatened us. It was a couple of Titotaurus, terrible creatures with enormous tails and a dull, glossy stare. The phosphorescent matter ejected from holes pierced around their muzzle, monstrous brutes, which would crush a whole man in their iron jaws. I did not know whether council stopped to classify them. For my part, I noticed their silver bellies and their huge mouths bristling with teeth. From a very unscientific point of view, and more as a possible victim than as a naturalist. Happily, the voracious creatures do not see well. They passed without seeing us, brushing us with their brownish fins. And we escaped by a miracle from a danger certainly greater than meeting a tiger full face in the forest. Half an hour, guided by the electric light, we reached the Nautilus. The outside door had been left open and Captain Nemo closed it as soon as we had entered the first cell. He then pressed a knob and I heard the pumps working in the midst of the vessel. I felt the water sinking from around me and in a few moments the cell was entirely empty. The inside door then opened and we entered the vestry. There, were diving, there our diving dress was taken off, not without some trouble, and fairly worn out from want of food and sleep, I returned to my room, in great wonder at this surprising excursion at the bottom of the sea.